everybody. Just a moment here. Well, thank you, Gabby, for uh, leading us in worship this morning. Uh, I really enjoyed that. Uh, and Silent Nights was uh, certainly a, a real bonus and encouragement, especially hearing you sing it in German as well. Uh, good job, uh, great song selection, and we are well into the Christmas season, so thank you for that and reminding us too that to the Advent and the weeks of Advent, that today is a, uh, traditionally the second week of Advent and it's peace. Um, also, nice looking Christmas tree as well. So, so uh, anyway, um, uh, good to be with you, everyone, uh, today during this Christmas season, and it is my pleasure to uh, bring to you God's Word. Before I do, though, I have a few announcements and things I'd like to share with you. Uh, but specifically, I'd like a couple of prayer requests that I have, and, and I guess maybe one or two announcements. So firstly, someone, uh, I was contacted that someone is in the hospital with uh, blood clots in both lungs. Uh, I don't have the, I can't uh, tell you who it is, but someone within our congregation, within their network, within their family, uh, has a member that is in the hospital. It's quite serious, as I said again, blood clots in both lungs. And so we are gonna pray together, wherever you're sitting, wherever you're standing, when you listen to this, when you're with me, I want you to, to agree with me because there is power in agreement of prayer. The Bible says we're two or three gather together in prayer. And I believe gather doesn't necessarily mean a physical location, but gather together in the spirit approaching the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I believe that good things will happen as we pray and that this individual will be truly impacted. Uh, April Parsons also requested prayer for her family this morning. And so nice to see that you're there with us. April, uh, back east, uh, joining us on live stream. Uh, sorry to hear you guys are in need of prayer, but we're glad to stand with you as well. So let's pray. Uh, Father, we do come to you today at this moment in time. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are indeed with us, that you abide in our lives that you are present with us at this moment in time. We turn our hearts to you. We turn our hearts to the one who is the healer, the one who answers our prayers, the one who takes care of us. By your stripes, there is indeed healing for us right here, right now, at this time. So we lift up this one that has been brought to my attention, Lord Jesus, who's in the hospital with blood clots in both lungs. And we pray right now, Lord Jesus, for your healing hand to visit this individual, to touch this person, Lord, in a very powerful way. We don't have to say her name. You know who this is. And so in Jesus' name, I pray healing upon you. I pray peace upon you. I pray strength upon you. The healing presence of the Lord be on your life in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody, in Jesus' name, amen. Also, we pray for April and Donald Parsons today as they've requested prayer. We pray, Lord Jesus, your blessing on them during this Christmas season. And, and April asked for prayer for her family. And we don't know the details of that either, but uh, we, we stand with them and we pray for your, uh, for your help and uh, ministry in their lives today as well, Jesus. Thank you, Father. And so, uh, Lord, we also just take a moment to pray for our message in God's Word today, that you will touch us, that you will speak to us. Lord, that the reality of who you are would touch us as we look at the Bible, that it would really impact us, Lord, as we think of you, Jesus, and your Spirit upon our lives. In your name, amen. Amen. Well, a couple of things I'd like to mention to you before I begin looking at uh, message for you this morning. Uh, I wanted to tell you that we have plans for Christmas Eve. How exciting is that? Looking forward to Christmas Eve. Uh, at first I was feeling a little disheartened, if you will, or discouraged thinking we can't have our normal Christmas Eve candlelight service. I just love how we do that in our church here. Uh, we pack the place out and, and it's just a great time to gather a connection. And I love how we offer that to our whole town and community. Uh, this time we've had as a leadership, uh, as a board and elders, we, 
we had something else on our heart. We felt, wouldn't it be great to live stream a service? And so we're going to do a live stream uh, Christmas Eve service. Uh, I have been in contact with a couple of other churches in town. And at this point, uh, the Baptist Church is going to join us for sure. Uh, and I'm happy about that. Maybe another church will, but I know for sure the two of us are. And so wasn't that awesome? So we're going to have at least a couple of our churches uh, cooperating and we'll be sharing songs with you and some scripture readings and bring that to you in your own homes on this particular Christmas Eve. So uh, that's coming up as well. Uh, I think that's everything. Uh, I want to thank Dan Jorgensen for bringing the word of the Lord to us last week and also reminding us, you know, of different in individuals that have been very influential in our church and influential in his life and in his family's life over the years and history of our church. And it is good for us to remember those that have labored amongst us. Uh, and, and as Dan talked to me afterwards, you know, we all have our lists of different people that we'll remember at the time and think of. And we are very wealthy as our church for the amount of people we have that are involved in so many ways in our church. And we're just so thankful for that. Uh, Misty again did a, put a beautiful sign up for us uh, during the Christmas season, which we prepare, and I'm sure thankful for her comes to my mind right now about the work she does in, in putting that in our community. Uh, and that influences and touches our whole town. So many people talk to me about the words that Misty puts out there uh, on our church sign uh, with a thought of encouragement for our town. So bless you, Misty, for that as well. And there's so many others, but I, uh, I won't get into our whole list right now. So I'd like to uh, bring something to you from the Bible today, from God's Word, and uh, the message that, that, that I have for you today is, is entitled, Christmas Extends Hope. And Dave, uh, Dave, this is for you, Dave McQueen, he always kind of kids me about looking at my watch as if I'm getting ready to uh, uh, finish my message or something. So, so, so Dave, hello Dave, <laughs> just anyway, a uh, private joke. So listen, getting back to the word of the Lord today, I really felt on my heart I wanted to speak to you about Christmas and particularly about how Christmas brings such deep and, and, and wonderful hope into our lives. And so I have three messages I want to speak to you over the next three weeks as we move further and deeper into the Christmas season and move towards Christmas Day. And so today, I would like to speak to you about hope. And next Sunday, I'm going to talk to you about joy. And then finally, uh, a message just before Christmas on peace. And these are major themes within uh, the focus of Christmas and the Christmas story. Uh, hope and joy and peace, the tremendous love of the Lord. And so I have decided to focus on these areas. And so today, I felt on my heart uh, that I would talk about hope. And so as we move into this message on how Christmas extends hope, I, I, I just recognize and realize, and you know, I'm not following necessarily the, the weekly calendar of Advent as what is historically and traditionally done, but I am following it in light of what I'm sensing in my spirit. And so today I'm feeling that people need to be aware that we have hope. There is such hope in the Lord, and, and, and we need that in our lives to, to, to bubble up within us from the Holy Spirit. But we also, in our whole world, and the people in our lives, they need to know that there is hope and that Jesus Christ brings the reality of hope into our lives. You know, as Christmas approaches, some, some people are struggling with discouragement. Others are struggling with depression. Others are struggling because of conflict. And what I mean by conflict is in the area of, you know, they're in the service industry, they're, they're, they have people coming into their, their stores, such as in Port McNeil and other places as well, and, uh, and they're finding it difficult because people sometimes, not always, but there are the odd person that comes in and they, they they're upset because of what's going on with COVID and the restrictions. But then they take it out on people that are just serving us and just doing their job. And that's so unfair. Uh, I would say that one of the reasons for that is that people just don't have hope. 
listen, we need to be instruments of hope and encourage people. Let's, let's, when we go into places with retail stores and people that are serving us in various industries, let's offer hope. Let's offer a word of encouragement. And uh, in our own, when we think of them afterwards, just a prayer of blessing over their lives. I think that would mean so much in this time. But that being said, I want to move on, you know, because, you know, there is struggling, and in, in, in even in good years, uh, when we're not facing COVID-19, there is a quite a high percentage of people that find this season very, very difficult. But it's even more difficult this year because of the COVID realities. And families cannot get together like they, and friends like they normally, normally would during this specific uh, uh, COVID season. I know ourselves, we're just on the verge of making a decision as well regarding our family and not being able to see our family. We've been putting that off, hoping, you know, and trusting and, and just wondering if maybe things would work out. But it's just not looking good for this year. And so that's difficult to come to grips with, right? And so, and I know I'm not the only one. I know there's many others in the same place. It reminds me of a, of a, a Christmas carol. Uh, I listened to it on the CMA Christmas uh, special on, on the television a couple of years ago when uh, Casey Musgraves was singing. And in her song, uh, she said, Christmas makes me cry. And she talks about feeling melancholy and talks about the people we will miss and that we can't be home. And so I think of that as well today, that, that sometimes we can be feeling that. And I think many of us are feeling that in some degree today. Uh, then there's other people in our midst. Uh, I'm not trying to labor this, but I'm just trying to talk to the reality of what we're facing. You know, Christianity isn't something that's in a box or in a closet off somewhere that doesn't relate to life. The reality of Jesus Christ touches us in the darkness and in the heavy areas of our lives, we see the reality of the Lord, his ability to encourage and to offer hope to us. And so with that in mind, I would draw our attention to the fact that this year, again, there are people that are missing loved ones, loved ones that have passed from this life and gone on to be with the Lord and uh, just no longer with us anymore. And so it could be their first Christmas without that loved one. And that's tough. Other people, it's been a few years, but it still feels almost like the first Christmas because they have such a wonderful relationship with that other family member or that close friend. And so they feel that as we come into the Christmas season and, and have mixed emotion. I get that. I understand that. But more than me, God gets that. And today, in this Christmas season, he would extend to you, within those realities, hope you. You know, uh, the Bible says, Solomon spoke, and he said this, he said, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Proverbs 13, 12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. And so Solomon was writing, and he said, there is such encouragement in hope. It makes us healthy and whole and keeps us balanced in our minds and in our spirits and our souls if we have hope. And so again, this message, as we come into this season, I would remind you that Jesus came and he brought hope. He brought hope when he was born and he's bringing hope today as a real, reality of what he accomplished so many years ago. You know, Dr. Victor Frankl, uh, was a psychiatrist, and he was in the uh, in the Second World War. He was in the Auschwitz prison camp in WW2, and and uh, as a psychiatrist, he wrote about what he observed and he saw in that terrible prison camp, with all of the heaviness and the darkness and the things that were going on, and he observed what helped people to survive. He penned these words, and I would like to quote Dr. Viktor Frankl right now. The prisoner who had lost faith in the future, his future was doomed. With his loss of belief in the future, he also lost his spiritual hold. He let himself decline and became subject to mental and physical decay. What a powerful statement 
from a psychiatrist as he observed what was going on in Auschwitz. What was he saying? He's saying people really begin to decay and find themselves mentally beginning to decay, physically, mentally, when they lose hope. He is describing that there is power and strength in hope. So again, what I'm speaking about today is so profound and so helpful in your life, right where you live now. Paul wrote, the apostle, he said in Thessalonians, he said, endurance inspired by hope. And so he said that hope helps us to endure. And so that really fits in here as well. So as I move deeper into the message, and I've sort of outlined why I feel in my heart to speak on this message, I would like to talk to you about four qualities that describe Jesus as our hope. Four qualities. I'd like to read from uh, the prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah said these, these words in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. For to us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government, government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called. Now we hear this a number of times. Uh, you know, it's one of those favorite verses in the Christmas season. But listen to this now as it goes on. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. Wow. Jesus is talking. This is 700 years. 700 years before Jesus was born. And it said he will be the wonderful counselor. He will be the mighty God and the everlasting Father. And the Prince of Peace. Well, we're going to look today at the first three. We'll leave the other one for another day about how he is the Prince of Peace because that will be my Christmas message. Few days before Christmas. Look at that verse, and if you have the Bible, you can follow me along. Just before Isaiah broke that, he said something else. He started it off in that chapter, in verse 1 and 2, when he said, he said, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. There will be no more gloom for those in distress. The people Walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Now that's profound. That was all talking about Jesus coming to this earth. Coming not just as a baby, but growing up, living amongst us, and particularly his ministry when he went out and he encouraged so many people bringing healing, words of hope, words of comfort and deliverance and power and life over the three years of ministry he had as he walked around at that day and age. In fact, do you know in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 4, the author, Matthew, one of the disciples, wrote Matthew, that, that book, and he spoke to that and he quoted those very words in Matthew 4, verse 15 and 16, talked about how Jesus went into a certain area geographically, and there these things took place. They saw a great light. Wow, in the shadow of death, a light has dawned. I'm going to talk more about the shadow of death a little bit later on. But the point again is that in a land of gloom, hope has come. Hope isn't just on good days, but Jesus comes in our darkest days and he brings hope to us. He did that when he walked on our planet those many, many years ago. Excuse me. So let's get into it. Firstly, I want to talk about how Jesus offers us hope by helping us to remember and reminding us this morning that Jesus is the ultimate counselor. Notice what it said? He is the counselor, right? Wonderful counselor. The ultimate counsel, counselor, I would say. Literally meaning, this word literally means when it was stayed, said by Isaiah, and then 700 years later when Jesus Christ walked on the earth, 
It literally means wonder of a counselor. Wonder of a counselor. The word wonder, to just dive into this a little further, means distinguished counselor or exceptional counselor. Jesus is the ultimate counselor, the exceptional counselor. Did you know that the Hebrew word for wonder here, do you know what it is? It's miracle, miracle. And so really, Jesus is the ultimate counselor. He is the miracle counselor. That's Jesus Christ. How awesome is that? And he lives in our lives today, and he desires. When you just would reach out in faith to him and just listen to him, he will give you miraculous counsel today. You know, uh, let's think of the Christmas story. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1 and verse 34, let's, let's read how the angel came and was led by the Spirit of God to speak as an instrument to Mary and uh, about the birth of Christ. That seems pretty relevant, right? So let's read that as an example of how God is the ultimate counselor. So in Luke chapter 1, verse 34, how will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. Now, if you, as the story developed, just for the sake of time, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of jumping in here, but for the sake of time, Mary was just told, She's about 16 years old. She's a virgin. She's never known a man. Uh, she's betrothed to Joseph, who will become her husband. And, and, and the God has just told her through the angel that she's going to give birth to a child in a miraculous way. And, and she's, she, just says, she just says, how could this be? How will this be, right? Since I'm a virgin. And so listen to what the Spirit of God told the angel to say to Mary. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she, who was said to be barren in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. And so Mary's response to, to that was, I'm the Lord's servant. May it be to me according to your word. She was satisfied with that and it allowed her to have hope and to believe and to trust. That was amazing counsel. It was words that she needed to hear at that moment. And so God spoke to her. He said, told her something about how this would happen, about how the Holy Spirit would overshadow her, shadow her that his presence would come upon her, and that, and, that, and that Jesus Christ would come into her womb as, and, and, and grow in her womb. And then, and then as a confirmation, the Holy Spirit said to her, now, another side to this is your cousin Elizabeth, you know, she, she, you know, she, she couldn't have children. She's six months pregnant. So, so stuff's happening. There are miracles taking place, and this is another one. So it was just exactly what Mary needed to hear to encourage her to move forward. Well, that's who God is. He gives us words that encourage us. He gives us confirmations to those things. He speaks to us in our own language. And so she accepts it, and she agrees with God's word. Yes, Jesus is the wonderful counselor. He is the miraculous counselor. Miracle counselor, that's who he is. You know, another thing I'd say about that is I think about how that Jesus offers us hope as a counselor. You know, it's good to remember that he's aware of all of the good and all of the ugly in your life. He is indeed, he's working behind the scenes in your life. Nothing ever surprises him. Nothing ever takes him off guard. Nothing you ever do causes him to say, huh, I didn't see that one coming. Now what am I going to do? No, he already knows. In fact, even when you do things you should not do, when you've made errors and mistakes, he comes into all of that and somehow he can 
he can creatively work within that for his ultimate pleasure and good. In fact, as a quote, this is a saying I, I say occasionally that I give every once in a while. God wastes nothing and he gets us ready. God wastes nothing and he gets us ready for the next step in our lives. The context, the, that means the verses, the, the, the paragraphs around and sentences, sentences around Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 which is what I started off with, you know, that for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, the government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. The words around that also tell us this. It tells us, as I was reading a little earlier, that the people were in the dark. That, that they, it actually says that they were in the shadow of death. There's that word, shadow of death. We're going to come back to that in a minute. He took the oppressive, it says in the third verse, he took the oppressive burden off their shoulders. Verse 3, he took the oppressive burdens off their shoulders. And then it goes on to say, and thereby he increased their joy. Well, that was again talking about Jesus. And 700 years later, Jesus walks on earth, and what did he do? He fulfilled those thoughts, the, 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 the detail, the technical aspects to those promises became a reality. Jesus increased their joy. But listen, listen, he still is the counselor. He still is the miraculous counselor. And he will come to you, and he will indeed help you out of that shadow of death. He will remove the oppressed, the burden off your shoulders. He will increase your joy. Believe it. It is true. He will do that. He will do that for you. And so he's the ultimate counselor. And his counsel is amazing. It helps us change our perspective, move us into new realities with him. Bless the Lord. Well, listen, there's more. Something else I want to talk to you about today that helps us as we think about our hope. We can, our hope is renewed as we just talk to the Lord and allow His Spirit to bring us counsel and encouragement. But here's more, something else I would say, and that is this. As we look at that same verse, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, it says He's the, the, uh, the wonderful counselor, but it also said He is the mighty God. And that's so true. He is the mighty God who watches over you. Praise the Lord. He's watching over you. You know, the prophetic complexities of Jesus' birth are just overwhelming. And what I mean by that is there's, there's specific Bible verses that talked about how Jesus would be born and where he would be born. And, 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 and yet, how did he... How could that be? How It seemed, if before Jesus came, it would seem contradictory. But Jesus fulfilled miraculously every single one. How could he do that? Because he's the mighty God. Because he's the mighty God. Let me give you an example. We find that the Bible foretells that the prophet Micah, let's talk about the people, not just use generically the word Bible. So Micah, Micah foretold that Jesus Christ would be born in Bethlehem. Micah 5, verse 2. He'll be born in Bethlehem. Where was he born? He was born in Bethlehem, right? But another verse says something different. It says in Hosea, Hosea the prophet said that Jesus Christ would be called out of Egypt, that he would come out of Egypt. Well, Bethlehem is not in Egypt, right? It's a different country. And then, as you look at the prophets, it was concluded that there was a, there, there's an understanding there, an implication through several prophetic uh, people that they wrote down that, that he would be called a Nazarene. Well, that's a different town altogether in Israel. So how does that work? The only reason it can work is because God is a mighty God, and he has a way putting all these things together. So as the story develops and Jesus is born, what happens? Yes, he was born 
as the Holy Spirit said several hundred years before, he was born in Bethlehem. Then what happens is Herod wanted to kill Jesus Christ. And so he issued orders that all the children in Bethlehem, two years old and younger, would be killed. Because he didn't want anybody interfering with him or, or, or taking over as king. And so he's threatened by Jesus Christ. And so an angel came and appeared to Joseph and Mary, let them know that this was happening and to take their son up. So they moved down to Egypt. But then when Herod passed away, the angel came and visited them again and said, it's okay to come back, go back to Israel now. So what's that? That's that verse. I have called him out of Egypt. And so he was called out of Egypt. And then they came back and a relative of King Herod was reigning out of Jerusalem. So they were uncomfortable, you know, settling in Jerusalem or Bethlehem, which was close to Jerusalem. And so they moved up to Nazareth. Isn't that, back, went back to Nazareth. And so Jesus was raised in Nazareth and became known as a Nazarene. So those three somewhat contradictory verses actually complement each other. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Jesus went to Egypt and was called out of Egypt. And Jesus became known as a Nazarene. What does that tell you? Wow, God's amazing. Wow, God is absolutely mighty, isn't he? And this stirs hope. Because listen, sometimes we get into a situation or we see the complexities of problems or the struggle we're in or the heaviness that we're feeling and, and, and the darkness that can be overwhelming, uh, the shadows of darkness, and we, and we don't know how we're going to get out of it. I want to assure you that he is the mighty God right now. Not only is the, he the wonderful counselor, but he's the mighty God and he is your mighty God at this moment, not just in the Christmas story in 2,000 years ago, but that is speaking to the reality of right here and right now. Bless God. You know, the Apostle Peter, he wrote, and in his book, in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 6, he wrote in a, in a time of intense, intense persecution. And he said, there is wonderful joy ahead, even though you have to endure many trials for a little while. So what's he saying? He's saying, it will change. You're going to get through this. And I've had people say that to me. You know, we think about COVID and that kind of stuff. And, 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 and you know, and we share with each other some of the things that we're feeling. And then we say to each other, we're going to get through this. Well, we are. But listen, I'm talking about more than positive thinking here. We have a God who is for us, and he's going to get us through this. Bless the Lord. Let's remember that today. Why? Because he is the mighty God. Uh, another thing we find here as I think about how he's the mighty God is that he's going to shine in the dark places. He shines in the darkness. Again, in Isaiah 9, where that's which has been the, the area I started with today, in Isaiah chapter 9, in those few verses, before we get to, you know, for unto us a son is born, unto us a child is given. It says, On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Repeated in Matthew of Jesus Christ. On those living in the land of the shadow, there's that word again, shadow of death, a light has dawned. Bless the Lord. Well, listen, the Lord brings hope in, in the land and in your land of the shadow of death and of darkness. A light is dawning. Jesus is bringing that light. I was uh, listening to a, a talk uh, the other day and a man was sharing a story about a pastor who's... Uh, wife had died and uh, it was sad to hear that that had happened and he had a little girl and, and after his wife had died being a pastor he decided to uh, do, the, do the funeral himself and speak at the funeral and so uh, during the funeral service for his wife who had tragically passed away and suddenly gone he read the 23rd Psalm 
And, you know, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow, shadow of the Almighty. Um, and, but anyway, he talked about the shadow of darkness as well, the valley of the shadow of darkness, as it says in Psalm 23. So anyway, he, he gave his message. And then him and his daughter were driving out to the graveside to do the internment. And uh, his little girl said to daddy, to his, to, 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 to his, to her daddy, the pastor, whose husband, her, you know, the mom, mom had passed away, the, the wife had passed away. And the little daughter asked her dad and said, said, what is the valley of the shadow of death? What does that mean? You know, she, she didn't understand. And so he's trying to think, how do I explain that to my little girl within the reality of what her and I are experiencing? She's lost her mom. I've lost my wife that I love so much. How do I explain that? And just then, a tractor trailer drove by their car as they were heading out to the internment site, to the graveside. And as the tractor trailer drove by, it caused a shadow from the tractor trailer to pass over the car. And, and so the dad said this to his little girl, he said, he asked her, would you like to get hit by that truck or by the shadow of that truck? Well, she quickly responded, said, well, the shadow, of course, the shadow, she responded. And so he used that to speak to his little girl. He said, what's the valley of the shadow of death? It's like the shadow of that big truck. Jesus went to the cross and he took the impact and he took the weight of all our sins and all of our pain. He took the heaviness of it so that all is left is the shadow of the valley of death. He took all the weight. He took all the impact. You're not getting hit with the truck. What you're feeling and can feel today is the shadow. I thought that was an amazing story that speaks to it as well. See, we go through the valley of the shadow of death at times in our life, and we feel like that. But listen, there is hope. God is going to get us through this, and Jesus can, will bring to you the words you need, and he will release things in your life that you will need in order to feel the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. And Listen, let's not just be selfish with this. Let's share this with people in our world as well. Well, there's one more thing I would mention, and that is that he is Father. Do you know what also says that he is the everlasting Father? Isn't that something? Let's look at it again and read it again. I think it's worth reading. It says, there will... No, where, wait a minute here. Let me get to the verse. Uh, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given... And the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. Let's talk about that, because that brings us hope as well. He's the Everlasting Father. What's that mean? Everlasting. It also could be translated Father of Eternity. You know, Jesus is the author and the possessor of eternity. Isn't that something? everlasting father. That's what it's saying. He's the father of eternity. The author, the possessor of eternity. He has life within himself. He is not just an image and a reflection of God. He is almighty God. And he has life within himself. He has the ability to give us eternal life. And he does that. You can have eternal life today. You can ask Jesus Christ to give you that, to give you eternal life, to come to you, to come be a part of you. And you know what he'll do? He will come to your prayer. He will come to the cry of your heart. He will extend hope to you. He will be your light today. That's who Jesus Christ is because he's very present, very real right now. He is the same right now as when he walked on the face of this earth. He's the same for you right now. Yes, he is. The Father, when it talks about Father, it speaks of his love for you. It speaks that he cares for you, right? 
that's what a father is intended to be. He is the perfect father. And so when he says he is the everlasting father, it also is referring to that, that relationship, that connectedness that we have with him as family, to know that he cares for us. He really, really cares for you. Do you know, it says in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7, Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares for you. Jesus has the same heart for us as the Father. Jesus Christ, who was born 2,000 years ago in a manger, in a stable, grew up, walked amongst us, died on a cross, rose from the dead, is seated at the right hand of the throne of the living God, and is the Father of eternity. He is eternal. He is still the same right now. And He is here in this moment of time. He's already here, and He's already, listen to this now, He's already in your future. Have you ever thought about that? He's not only here right now, He's in your future. Right? And, and I mean that he sees your future. He's in that place within your future, waiting for you there as well. Because, you see, he sees past, present, and future. He's not limited to the time continuum, continuum, if you want to use that word, that we are. That's amazing. He's a mighty God. He is the everlasting Father. But, you know, it's so comforting for us. I know I had a good friend a number of years ago. He's still a friend. But, I mean... Yeah, a good friend in, in Victoria, and I remember him saying, you know, all something had happened, a really physical issue came up, which was life-threatening, and I can remember him talking to me after a church service, and he said, and he said this, do you think that God was taken by surprise? And of course, we all concluded, we all smiled and said, no, God knew this. God knew this. And there's something comforting to know that he's with us now, but that he's in our future and he's waiting for us in our future. I just love it. So God's got it all figured out for you. Just, just, just let him bring you light and hope in this moment in which you live. Jesus will always keep his promises. I got one more promise to share, and that's from Isaiah 41 and in the 13th verse. And it says, For I am the Lord your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. I think we need to read that again. For I am the Lord your God. Isaiah 41 verse 13. Your God, I am the Lord your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. You say, well, I'm trying to hang on to hope. You don't have to. You don't have to. You know, uh, it's like you're a little girl or a little boy and you're holding on to the hand of the Father here. But really think about it for a minute. It's not your strength holding on to his hand, but it's his strength holding on to your hand. All you need to do is acknowledge that. You know what I'm saying? Just rest in that and let his hope be with you today. I am the one who takes care of your hands, and I say, do not fear, I'll be with you. So, this morning, the Christmas story is a story that presents to us hope. And may hope be yours today. Jesus is the ultimate counselor and would be your counselor. You know, I tell you, I've got a journal, I write down stuff, and uh, I try to write down the stuff that God has told me, the things he's spoken to me, and some of them are quite profound, the way he spoke to me, not just what he said, but the way he told me, that have brought comfort and encouragement and direction into my life. Uh, I, I'm just so thankful he wrote it down. So he is a wonderful counselor. He is a miraculous counselor. And so Jesus is also the mighty one, and he is mighty in your life and in your circumstances. He can take a bunch of complicated stuff and he'll pull it together for the glory of God and to take care of you. He really will. 
you're going to get through this. And then lastly, Jesus will father us. He will father us forever. He will father us through our todays, and he will father us through our tomorrows. Isn't that beautiful? Thank you, Lord. That's so great. Well, listen, I want to I want to pray for you this morning. And I have a prayer that I would pray. And it's from Romans chapter 15, verse 13. And it's a prayer that Paul prayed to the church in Rome. And I'm going to pray it twice. Once you hear it, so you hear it. And secondly, so you'll pray it and agree to it. Okay? It goes like this, Romans 15, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray that together then. Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning, and I thank you for your word, that you are indeed the God of hope. Hope came to earth 2,000 years ago. It was a dark time, lots of dark shadows, but you came in and shone the light on it. And Lord, today you will come into our lives and you will shine the light on it. And those we are burdened for and concerned about our lives, you will come and you will shine the light on that too. We thank you for that. And so, Lord, we pray, may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is your hope. God bless you. Thanks for listening.